If you all want to stand, we're going to sing with opening the eyes of my heart.
to 52. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the firstborn inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the day will be raised and perishable, and will be, then we will be changed. Those are words you've heard before. Just to remind you of them again, what's going to happen. You, I like watching TV. I'm a TV ad, I'm a certain area where you can take a book and read for hours, but I got a look at TV. I like sports, I like to watch mysteries. Best thing I like is cowboy shows. That sounds crazy to an older person, but you've got to have a cowboy shows. And uh, every now and then I just get all excited in the cowboy show. And the best part goes off. It says "to be continued." You ever see that in the bar? You're all excited about the show and to be continued. Well, back in 1950, in the 50s. You follow some of you think that's a long time ago, but that's just like yesterday. When I was growing up, I often went to a Saturday matinee, which was in a little schoolhouse uh, back in Ohio. In fact, if you drive back towards 340 and you see the little gray building, that was my, as Jesse would say, my higher education. Uh, I was down the road about a quarter of a mile. Uh, in Ohio, and uh, that was the schoolhouse I went to. And every weekend, they had a little matinee. There would be a uh, cartoon, uh, either the Road Runner or Bugs Bunny. I shot that rabbit a dozen times, I'm sure. Uh, and the movie, the main movie, came on. And you won't believe this, but it was some movies. Uh, Somebody laughed. It was Silent Moon. Some of you can remember Silent Moon. I think it was Clyde and Merrill's family that used to get their wheels. And the movie would last about uh, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most, and a little uh, screen. And all of a sudden, it would be to be continued. So you had to go to the next week to get the gist of the story because you had to be able to read underneath the movie. And, uh, Whenever we got to the good part, we said we continue. There seemed to be no way from life's threatening situations in those characters in those movies. Well, somebody was getting shot, or somebody was going to drown just before the to be continued uh, came on there. Well, as we read in Paul's letters here to uh, Corinthians, uh, we know that he was no stranger <clears throat> uh, to life threatening situations. He was in prison, he was beaten, stoned, and shipwrecked, and he thought to take the good news of Jesus Christ's people. He knew that someday he would die, but he never considered that to be the end of the story. It was always to be continued. We, we are not like the movie heroes who always escape certain death. The day will come when our earthly lives will end, either by death or Christ's return. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, which we remember as we come around this table, the story of your life, the story of my life, is to be continued in an everlasting life. So as Christians, we believe that we live on and we someday see Jesus and the Father. I ask you to give thanks for the great and the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we gather around your table this week, we know that this life is just but a short passing and that we are here for a while on earth and that is our hope that it would be continued with you in heaven. We know that's only possible through the wonderful gift of your Son who came to earth to become as a man to die and suffer on the cross for us. 
As we gather here on this table today, we ask you to bless this loaf, it's the emblem of that body that was broken for us, and to bless this cup, the emblem of the blood that was shed for us. And we do pray this in your son's name. Amen. because of the faithfulness of our God. And, and that's something that we celebrate each and every week, the fact that God is faithful to us. So we talked about how God has always been faithful to his people throughout all generations, from the very beginning of time on until even today. And he continues to reveal himself to us as his people through our faith. This week, we're going to move forward a little bit further, as you can kind of see on the, the map here. We're going to move down the road a little ways to Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. Um, and Spring Hill is a beautiful place. I've been there once before. Um, and they have a motto there that you should see us now. Um, but before we get into this morning's message, let's just open with a word of prayer. God, I just thank you uh, for this morning that we have to be together and to celebrate the life that we have in you. You are a truly amazing God. Um, we thank you um, that we can be here this morning. Um, and Lord, we just pray that as we're here this morning, that you uh, help us to, to open our hearts and um, to just be open to your leading in our lives um, through your word. Lord, may I not be the one that's speaking today, but you speaking through me. And Lord, help us to leave here this morning challenged 
how to something that we can take home with us and apply it to our lives. Me and my friend. Amen. Speeding down the highway towards Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, you see the scenery of trees all around. And honestly, this time of year, it's got to be beautiful because it's fall. <coughs> and let's just face it, fall is one of the most beautiful seasons there is. And of course, that's the calm before the storm, which is winter. But as you're driving down the highway towards Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, in the distance, you'll see this sign coming clearly more and more. And this sign appears in the distance. And as you get closer, you make out the words, Spring Hill, you should see us now. Proudly on display for all to see as they pass by. For those who pass by, this slogan may seem like some sort of random cliche or an overconfident town saying, you should see us now, look how great we are. But for those who know the history of the town of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, they're all too familiar with the story of this town. This former town, which is all too familiar with disaster and sacrifice. Their slogan is a defiant declaration that there is life after hardship. There is life after loss. Once this town, Spring Hill, was known as a town that was an economically growing town because of a thriving coal mining industry through the years. But all mining ceased in this town in the 1970s, and Spring Hill has been in an economic decline ever since. This town became a community in 2015. They are no longer referred to as a town because they don't have the finances or the population to sustain that title. Today, this community is most famous for three mining disasters and being the hometown of country music star Anne Murray, who was actually on the news the other day, ironically. The history of the town of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, and if you're interested in it, I, I encourage you to check it out, is one of a roller coaster ride. There are lots of ups, and there are lots of downs, and then ups again, and then downs. And so as I studied this for this week's message, I got to thinking that their story is not unlike many of ours. So there's lots that we can learn from their slogan, and there's lots that we can learn about their life and their, their community that can also be something important that we can take home with us as well. We certainly have those moments in life, don't we, where there's ups and downs. We don't mind those times in life when life is great and it's grand, but how do we handle those difficult times when things are on the downward slope? Have you ever known someone in your life who seemed to enjoy success nearly every aspect of life, like they had some sort of magical golden horseshoe up their rear ends? Many of these folks, they struggle to handle failure and loss because they've grown so accustomed to these triumphs that they celebrate all the time. People who are unable to deal with an imperfect set of circumstances often sink into depression and anger. And sometimes they isolate themselves if they've come from this point where they are always, always feeling this success. How do you react when the circumstances of your life become hard? Unlike in the movies, as Sonny had talked about in his communion thought, which is only entertainment or a best art, in the real world, we can't avoid everything that's sad or unpleasant that comes our way. We can't just change the channel and avoid difficult parts, and we can't avoid what it is that's going to happen in our life. It's going to come, and we have to learn to deal with it. That's the bad news. If I stopped there, that'd be it. That would be depressing. But there is good news. There is good news, and that's why we're here this morning, is to celebrate that good news. The good news is that by God's grace, and by His power, and by His love, which is more sufficient than anything that we need in this life, there is hope for us. For those who have come to know God's faithfulness, as we talked about last week, there is no pain so intense, no sorrow so overwhelming, no loss so devastating, that God can't bring us through it if we've come to it. Listen to what the Apostle Paul, who was a close friend of Jesus, and what he had to say in Scripture. This man, he had been suffering physically for quite some time, and he had been going through some big time struggles. And he probably hit rock bottom once or twice. And as he hits rock bottom, these are his words in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9, as he speaks of his struggles. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, whatever it was he was dealing with. But he said to me, this is God speaking to him, My grace is sufficient for you, 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9, we read another scripture written by Paul. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Do you ever feel that way? Like you were hard pressed on every side? Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. What does all of this tell us? Why does this all matter? We learn from this that even God's most faithful followers we're not immune to the bumps and bruises in this life. But Paul makes very clear here that there is merit even in those struggles for us to remain faithful and have faith in God who has been faithful to us. Paul lived in the exact same world that you and I do. And I know that I personally learned that sometimes life it just kicks our butt and it's not easy. We get knocked down just like anyone else. We feel pain. We experience sorrow, we experience loss. We weep and we mourn. But there's a difference for us when we believe in who God is and when we know who God is. That's what marks the difference when we come to those obstacles in life if we know God as opposed to if we don't know Him. As we talked about last week, we know that God is faithful. We know that deep down. We've seen it as we read through the pages of Scripture how God has been faithful all throughout time and how as we look back on our lives we can see how he's been faithful to us now. This makes all the difference. God promises in his words that he will bring us through every storm. He guarantees that nothing will ever happen in our lives that we can't handle if we have his grace and his power by our side. That's the bottom line truth of scripture. That's the underlying truth. There is hope even when it looks like the bottom is falling out. This truth alone keeps us steady, it keeps us confident as we live in the struggles of this world, as the world around us is shaking and it feels like it's breaking apart. The kind of peace that God gives us, it can't be faked. The kind of peace that He gives us, it's unexplainable, it's miraculous, and yet at the same time, it is mysterious. And people wonder, how can somebody going through so much handle that? whatever it is that they're going through. How can they survive life after going through this? Today we're going to look at surviving life after loss, after struggle. And I'll admit to you right up front that this topic is a pretty broad topic because there are so many different kinds of losses and struggles that we face in this life. There are losses in relationships, people who we love who die, Marriage partners who abandon us, children who reject us, close friends who we've seen move away from us. There are personal losses like injuries or loss of health. Given all that, is there possibly anything that could be said this morning that could give somebody some hope, give somebody some help, and maybe be meaningful in some way to somebody who's in one of those situations? I believe whenever we go into God's Word, the answer of that is yes. I believe in God's Word, we find all meaning, we find all purpose, and we find all hope in our struggle. There are some common biblical principles which will help us to respond in a healthy and a God-honoring way when the difficulties in this life come. My prayer is that today, if you're having a difficult time, that you might find some renewal and find some hope in God's Word to help you process your situation and overcome so this morning, the first thing that I want to share with you that we can learn that's important as we face life, surviving life after loss, is this. That we need to allow ourselves to grieve. This may seem obvious to some, but many people think that grieving is somehow weak or shameful or even less Christian to grieve. As if expressing pain or sorrow would offend somebody or even surprise God that we're going through something. So a lot of people, they'll suppress their emotions, they'll hold back what it is that they're feeling, and they'll try everything else that they can to just kind of hide that emotion a little bit. And so somebody comes up and they're having a hard day, and you say, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, things are great. Life's just awesome. When inside, that's not what they're thinking. Something's going on. They put in a calm, cool, collected front. Meanwhile, inside, they are breaking and they're broken and they're angry. 
Nothing about living this way is healthy. And it's not what God wants for us. Let's look to the example of Jesus. He's always a good example here of what we need to look to. John chapter 11, 33 to 35. There we read, When Jesus saw her, referring to Mary, weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. On this particular occasion, Jesus is coming because one of his closest friends, named Lazarus, has passed away. He has died. And it made Jesus upset. And it says in the scripture that he was deeply moved in his spirit, in his inner being, and he was troubled by this. He wasn't trying to keep a stiff upper lip. You know, oh, he's gone. Lazarus is gone. Lazarus is dead. He wasn't holding back. He wasn't concerned about what someone thought about his grief. He wasn't concerned somebody would think that he had a lack of faith or trust in God. His tears simply expressed what was in his heart. And so Jesus wept right in front of God and everybody. Do you believe that that's unmasculine to let your emotions show? Sometimes I think that it'd be inhuman not to let our emotions show. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4 says there is a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. In Romans chapter 12 verse 15 we read rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. How do we usually respond when someone around us is feeling upset? Who's hurting inside? Well if you're anything like me you try to snap them out of it. You try to do whatever you can to be there and just talk to them about their situation and make them feel better. To try to cheer them up and put a smile on their face. I ask Amanda all the time, Amanda, are you happy? And of course her answer is yes because she knows if I, she gives me a no, well then I'll do everything I can to fix it. So sometimes we try to fix things and we say, oh, well, it's not so bad. Or we might say, oh, well, it says this in the Bible. But there is a right time when it's not right for us to just simply cheer up and move on. Because it's okay for us to mourn, it's okay for us to feel. It's human. There's a time when the most helpful thing that we can do for someone is just to mourn alongside of them. I experienced this a long time ago in my own life when my parents decided to split up. And that was probably the most difficult time of my life. It broke me. And I had no clue how to handle it. But I'll never forget the one day when I couldn't hold back anymore, when I was just rock bottom. I, I was done. And I started blubbering in front of my friend Dan. And he literally just sat with me. And he listened. And he mourned with me. That day, Dan helped me to face the reality of my situation. And he came alongside me as I came face to face with it. It was a necessary thing, and it meant more to me than what Dan will ever know. He'll never know how much that really meant to me. That memory is forever in my mind, and honestly, it made our, fr our friendship so much stronger. It's a necessary thing for us to have those times. We need to allow ourselves and to allow others to grieve so that at the appropriate time, we can move forward. And the thing is that if we don't process those grieving feelings, then we can't move forward because we'll hold on to them and they'll come back to haunt us. But as we grieve, there's something important beyond this for us to remember. And that's my second point for this morning. Although it's important for us to grieve, it's also important for us to recognize that grief is not the final word. It's not the end. There's a to be continued in here somewhere. Because even in the midst of our sorrow, even in the, the depths of our grief, God, He is still with us. He's still in our presence. He is still faithful. He hasn't abandoned us to leave ourselves in our grief alone. I believe in my time of hardship, in my struggle that I faced, that God was very present there with me as I dealt with that struggle. He showed Himself to me through my friend, Dan. God is there when we're hurting. God was there, and he used Dan to be there at just the right time. And so he found a way to comfort me. Better than any friend, better than any relative, better than any pastor, better than any counselor ever could. 
And God's Spirit comforts those who have faith in Him with a deep and a powerful and mysterious peace that restores our strength and it lifts us up beyond our despair and takes us to a higher place. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 3. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. This goes for us as well. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide to, for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So how much of our sorrow is God able to deal with? All. In which of our troubles is God present and comforting us? All of them. Every single one. And every kind of trouble and any number of troubles that we face, God's power is sufficient in our weakness, just as Paul had written. Whatever painful losses we may experience or even imagine, there's nothing too difficult for God. His power to strengthen us, to sustain us, and to comfort us, and take us to a higher place beyond the circumstances that try to drag us down. I know that it can be difficult to believe at times. And there are moments when our trust just falters. It's hard for us to have faith in God. Sometimes we look at other sources of comfort to put our faith in, other ways that we can comfort our pain of our loss, whether it be alcohol, drugs, TV, food, sex, anything you think of, you can you put blank in there to dull the pain of what we're going through. But nothing ultimately can give us that lasting comfort, that eternal peace that we crave in our very soul. Only God is able to comfort us in the midst of any and every circumstance. So will you look to him this morning, if you are in that place right now where you are grieving and you are looking for hope beyond what you're going through? There's another point that I'd like to make. You and I, we tend to see a dead end when we look at our grief. We think, oh, I'm going through this and that is it. That is final. We add something, we lost it, and now it's gone. There's nothing left but a big hole in our life. But God doesn't see it that way. The stories that he writes, as Sonny alluded to in the communion thought, which I think that's hilarious, they don't end in loss. That which is broken, God always restores. And that's the final point. Have you ever watched those shows, those home renovation shows before on HGTV? Anyone ever see those? I find them boring as watching paint. But you know what? Sometimes there's a meaning in them. Some of those guys, they go to some of these old broken down houses that are condemned like this one, and somehow they look at this house and they say, oh, this could be miraculous, this could be beautiful, this could be like a mansion of wonders. You know, you should you know, look at this for what it is, and then they kind of build it up and they make it into something magnificent. I think they demolish the house actually and build it back up and they say, look what I did. They cheated. But, you know, in all seriousness, they take something that looks like a dump and they turn it into something fabulous. I believe firmly that I have seen in my life God do the very same thing. And He is the master of restoration. You think of the biggest dump you can imagine. God will make it wondrous and amazing. God takes us even when we're broken and damaged. And God knows I'm damaged. And if we trust in his plans, he's able to do some pretty amazing things. So as we go about this life, let's go about this life expecting that God's going to give us his best. And that he's going to be the one to heal our pains, to restore us in our moments of loss, and to provide exactly what it is that we need. Give all your cares and your hurts to the Lord, because he hears you and he desires to bring healing to your life. He doesn't want you to remain in that spot. He wants to take you to a better place. In the book of Kings, King David was going through a time of struggle and hardship. A very big struggle and hardship. But I encourage you to check that out for yourself. Dig a little deeper. And he called out to God in his deepest hour of need. He had hit rock bottom. 
He done that a couple times. And in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 5, God says this to him. I have heard your prayer, and I have seen your tears, and I will heal you. That same promise he gives to us. And this time I'll ask the band to come as we kind of close out here for this morning. As we read that scripture, may that be the promise that we hold true to our hearts. May that be what we pray. I have heard your prayers. I have seen your tears. And I will heal you. That is God's response. Reach out to God in faith during those times when you are feeling lonely and in need of a friend. Because he is there for you. Seek God with all your heart and trust Him with your future. As you look back on the situation later, then you'll say to yourself, as the people in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia say, you should see us now as you proudly look to a God who is forever faithful to you. As you look back on your situation, whatever it is, may you be able to say, as I do with my situation with my parents, there is so much that I learned from that that has given me such knowledge in my own relationship, in my own family life. And as I look back on that situation, I see how God has blessed it, how God has worked in it. You know, what can you say of your story? How will you proclaim that look what God's done? You should see us now. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word, the life-giving message that it gives us, the hope that it restores within us. Lord, we pray for your healing today. Lord, that if there's anyone here this morning who's going through a struggle, Lord, that you'll just rest on them, that you'll give them some direction, some guidance, and whatever it is that they're going through. If they're confused, help us to know where it is that they were going. Uh, Lord, that you might be with everyone here this morning, Lord, that we might leave here feeling your presence, knowing full well, with confidence, that you are a God who is faithful. And Lord, that by our faith, we are able to see your mighty works around us. Lord, help us to reclaim proudly your grace as we leave this place. In the name I pray. Amen. This morning we're going to do our closing song, which is Higher Ground. So if this morning you want to make that commitment for yourself to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to stand as we sing that closing song this morning.